I grew up in Austin, specifically South Austin, uh, which is historically mm, more integrated than North Central Austin. Um, yeah. Hey, and yeah. Can you describe your experience as far as um, growing up in your neighborhood? Sure. What, what, what was that like? Well, I lived in an old country house that what had been a country house that my grandfather had purchased around 1925. And my grandfather was a socialist back in the day, and so he believed everybody should have housing and should have what they needed. So he had rental houses around town, but she didn't own either. <laughs> he was making payments on, but he was just as often likely to take food to people as he was to collect a rent from them. And I don't know what race those people were. It didn't matter to him, didn't matter to us. Um, when I, my family, when my parents started a business at that house, it was called Green Pastures, and from the day it was opened, it was integrated. Um, now, it wasn't really integrated, it just wasn't segregated. It wasn't really not segregated, it just meant if a group of people, of any people, wanted to come and have an event there, they could, which was not true of Austin at that time. That was, this was in the 40s. So that's just kind of been where we rolled from. And so I went to, my parents were Catholic, so I went to Catholic schools, which for the most part were, it's one that they weren't integrated, it's just that the, which is part of my story today, it's just that the way the Catholic Church was segregated, people of different colors were segregated. And I think there's an implication behind that that is absolutely enormous. I feel that way about any church, but particularly that church, because that's a church I grew up in. Okay, so you mentioned a couple things that we definitely are going to get to um, within your community. I see that you were raised in a household that welcomed um, everybody. Everybody. Exactly. And um, so, what is your personal perspective? as far as um, growing up and maybe your experiences with race? Sure, so while my neighborhood was definitely integrated with black, white, and Hispanic, um, and while there was an acceptance of everybody, there was still something back here because of just the way things were structured that said there was a difference. Now, one level of difference was uh, the people who worked in our house who were Hispanic, who were Swedish, who were black. I mean, just the way that rolled. We had a restaurant and catering business, and some of our wait staff were actually professors from uh, Houston Tillotson. And the only, and I didn't have any understanding of that because I was just a child, and I didn't know Houston Tillotson, blah, blah, blah. But I knew that we referred to these persons by their surname, Mr. So-and-so, as opposed to the people who worked with us in the kitchen who we were all referred to by their first name. Um, and I know a story that a woman who worked for our, with our family for 65 years, both in the just family family and then into the restaurant business, told a story. Every year for the past 70 plus years, my family has put on a Christmas pageant, which you know the story of Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem and all the whole deal. So we put on a story about that as based on biblical text. And uh, Amy Nelson, Miss Nelson, uh, had a young son. And so my mother, this was before I was born, but my mother invited Amy to bring her son, um, Billy, to be in the play. And in the news, this was in the 50s, which we already know is a rock and roll bad time. Anyway, in the newspaper picture, it named everybody in the group on stage except him. And it was, and then it was just said, and a Negro boy. Okay, so there's that piece. Amy's parents came to the performance, and first of all, they were sitting whatever back here. And my mother said, oh, no, you must sit up front because your child is in the play and you want to be able to see. So I'm sure this is a shortened piece, but Amy's mother said, 
you really need to stick with these people because they will treat you well. Because there was an understanding of inclusion and equity, we would never have used those words because they were not like in our thing, um, understanding that, that all of this was well. So you mentioned some other great things uh, with that, um, with that experience of kind of first being exposed to that difference, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> the, could you expand on when did you start to realize equality may have not been the same as equity and, and yeah. how to really define that? Can you elaborate on that? Maybe. Okay. We'll see how I do, and you may have to guide me. And I'm willing, I'm very open to that. I can tell you when I was 13, and I was about 13, and I flew to Washington, D.C. to see my sister who was living there. This was the first time I ever saw persons of color in positions of power. And I'm not talking about power. But I am talking about levels of management and so on and so forth in state and federal offices. I mean, it was just very, obviously very uh, natural within the environment of Washington, D.C. And I remember having this kind of conscious feeling and actually having to go home to my sister's place and sit down. I didn't reject it. I just didn't understand it because it was something I'd never seen before. And I didn't know how to reconcile it with something that was hanging back here because I was prejudiced. Not because I was taught to be prejudiced, but because I existed, I grew up in a prejudiced environment. And so it was never, it's never easy to reconcile that which is counter to what your environment is telling you, even if I don't act on that or act in the way that that might have otherwise been acted on, which we didn't. Uh, but it was just still kind of something to try to reconcile that in my conscious brain. And actually, it ended up kind of being nice, because I said, oh, this is possible. This exists in the world. Yeah. And I, I welcome that idea of it existing in the world and that um, you are kind of accepting of that existing in the world. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you mentioned about the thing kind of hanging in the back mm -hmm. relating to the environment. Could mm -hmm. you maybe expand upon ways that that environment has um, shaped how you view and how maybe over, like just kind of give us some insight on how you try to overcome that maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I doesn't really make a difference at one level. I'm trying to seek another word rather than overcome. I think it's more like trying to stay conscious that the counter always is existing, not so much by choice, but by it is. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so to me, it's very uh, frustrating if I go to an event and they're, regardless of color, there are not people of color there. It's like, so like, but um, yeah, so I, I think um, at, le at some level, it is sort of, you might say, oh, really? Uh, but it's sort of the oppression of being privileged without having asked to be privileged and knowing that I benefit from being privileged. But it's kind of like not asking to be black not asking to be Hispanic. We're just, we, it, we are. And so then within that field, uh, there's some poem by Rumi that I'm not gonna remember, but it has something to do with, we lay down all this other stuff, and then we come together and meet in the field together. And I just think that's kind of where I hope that someday we'll be. And I think, you know, this, <laughs> the fact that I feel welcomed here today, to me is an example of that, and I like to think that uh, other activities that I'm involved in are other examples of that. I agree, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, so, your insight.
insight as far as on um, being conscious and uh, not... Well, trying to be conscious. I'm not saying I'm always conscious. Sometimes we don't know what she is. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, well, trying to be conscious yeah. and, and also... Um, fighting to uh, get to that point of being <coughs> together. What is your experience that kind of led you to start wanting? <coughs> To be honest with you, I'm going to tell you a really kind of sad story, and I may cry. It's one day when I was trying to understand and asked Amy, because she was like my second mother, or maybe like my first mother, because my other mother was kind of well, gone. I was trying to understand color. I couldn't understand why her color was different, and I didn't understand why the inside of her hand, so the inside of my hand is basically the same color as the outside of my hand. I did not understand that coloration. I don't know that I still understand the coloration. But I asked her about it and I felt like, I felt in that asking her about it that I had crossed a line. And there's another story, but anyway, that I'd crossed a line and that that, I got some, well, I'll take yours. But anyway, that I'd crossed, thank you, sir. I'd crossed a line um, and somehow transgressed against her person. So, so I had gone from is to why and what are you? Why are you different? What is the difference? And I don't think she, I don't recall that she was able to answer that, not for any reason other than it was a total anomaly of a question. It was not something that she would have been expected or that she had had a discussion about. I don't remember, but I just remember that sense of what I felt was a hurt or a transgression. I wouldn't have known that as a child. I just would have known I'd done something inappropriate or wrong or potentially cruel. And I loved Amy. So, so then that feeling, um, I see that there's yeah. really good love for her. Yeah, a very, very, very so I, want, I think at some level, and that was a small child. That was before going to Washington or any of that. So I wanted to understand. That's really what I wanted. I wanted to understand. I think if I had potentially had been had. But it was interesting. I didn't go to an adult and ask them. I mean, she was an adult. I didn't go to another adult and ask them. So I must have already known on some level. This is what I'm making up now. That... I felt then there not only was there shame in my question, there was a shame in the existence of my understanding or feeling that there was a difference. You understand what I'm saying? And so it just, I think it confounded me as a child. At one level, it continues to confound me. You know, I think after taking, undoing racism for the third time, I mean, I knew from the first time, but an understanding that Race is a construct, but it's a, you know, you play the card, you play the hand hard, and you just, you know, you ruin a lot of people's lives, or you affect a lot of people's lives very negatively. So, so there's that piece where I will suggest to somebody something, you know, like, well, why is that or not? Why are we that or not? And they'll say, well, Martha, that's just too logical. So then I have, to me, the conundrum of, I've spoken something that can be understood and is valued as logical, but it's not worth, it doesn't have worth within the deal. I don't know why I'm taking you down that rabbit hole, but it's something about, I think it's something that has something to do with the fact that since there is no racial difference, there is not even, I mean, there's a human race and that's it, then why is it that we continue to perpetrate a wrong that, frankly, everybody suffers. Whites might not know it, but they're losing out on a tremendous field of brilliant people with great 
knowledge and capacity because we're locking them up or we're saying we're not going to give you credit so you're not going to be able to go to school, you're not going to be, whatever it is that we, all the systems that are in place. Not going to give you health care. So I still live in the conundrum. dealing with that conundrum and dealing with the fact that you didn't ask for this environment that spawned yeah. this. Uh, what, what are your feelings personally towards the matter? What um, action do you attempt to do personally mm -hmm. about the that's interesting about the matter. That's very key. Well, I show up a lot. I uh, have participated in and have promoted programs that I think there's benefit to the community in engaging a broader part of the community together, like this today. Um, I'm, I've worked on a, I've been on several committees and I've tried, uh, particularly at ACC Highland where I've tried to uh, provide them the historic perspective that that was a place for several decades for exceptional black education before ACC came there. And how do you, you know, and the value particularly when they say they want to retain and graduate and so on and so forth, people, people of color, then how there's a value in having to sharing that history up and saying this was exceptional then and what you're doing now is exceptional. And then bringing the policies and the support with that so that it's actually actualized, not just lip service. So. Uh, I wouldn't say that I've always been successful, <laughs> but you know, sometimes the logic just doesn't carry. So, yeah. And then just in my own relationships, trying to, uh, you know, consciously wanting and acting to expand my own relationships so that it's, they're more inclusive and hopefully equitable. Uh huh. In um, you know relationships and showing up as a youth um, with all of that, what do you think on a maybe global level that it would take for them to um, to start listening, to start realizing that uh, realization of you know excellence in the black community as well as you know, the other communities that are trying to step up. You know what I love is that it's already shifted. It's scaring them, scaring this little tiny piece. I don't, I think it's really just, I truly think there's just like when, you know, when you've tried to do a really good plan in your community or something, and there's like these two or three voices come up, and they are so mean and so nasty that nobody else wants to play because they're so vicious. They don't want to be dealing with that. So. I don't know what's going to be done with those that little piece of really vicious stuff, um, but I believe that more and more is shifting, and at minimal, there is a shift in uh, the uh, population, so that we live in a population that is a population of color. Now. How long is it going to be before those words sink into the ears? How long is it going to be before that's a value? I mean, if you go back and you look at uh, the history of advertising to sp targeted specifically to back black population, what was that thinking? Well, they said, oh, shit, there's billions of dollars out here being spent. We need to pay attention. Now, so what was the motivation? Well, it was billions of dollars. So there's that, you know. <laughs> um, I just think there's just so much history that's not being taught. Like yesterday I went down to the city, what was yesterday? Someday. I went down Thursday to the city council because they were doing a proclamation that uh, council member Oral, Oral Houston, who was here earlier today, brought forward. It was a proclamation recognizing the 1928 
ordinance that formally segregated Austin. Okay, so there was a proclamation. So, okay. So she is asking me today, why didn't I come down front to get to my picture with the other people? And I said, well, first of all, I wasn't invited. She said, well, yeah, it's in me and Zenobia. And she said, well, yeah, you were invited. She said, I said, everybody come down. Well, not everybody went down. So if I didn't go down, I probably went down, didn't go down for the same reason not everybody went down. You know what I'm saying? And so then uh, somebody posted a picture of themselves and another person who had been there for the proclamation, and I posted under it. And I said, so does this mean that the proclamation of 1928 will now be taught to elementary school children so they'll have a context of why Austin has been divided and acted upon the way it is? Does this mean that the African-American quality of life, Mexican quality of life, Asian quality of life will finally be funded at all in any way? And if not those, then how about, is there actually strategic, specific, intended steps to follow through from this proclamation? Otherwise, it's just a little stamp, it's just a little bow, it's just a little band-aid on something that has been just highly destructive in our community. I didn't get any responses back. But I'm just saying, so part of it is because I am white, I can say stuff like that, and, I, uh, and I'm generally not questioned. Why? Because I'm white. I can get away with it, as it were, whatever that means. But I also, uh, Zenobia's trying to coach me. You know, we're both trying to coach each other. And how can we discuss something that we feel so passionately about without coming across angry and like the other people are stupid? You know, there's got to be a weather, better way to deliver what we're delivering. But it just continues to confound me that we had, like we had a year and a half ago when the mayor and new council came in, the mayor did this big thing called Spirit of East Austin. The whole idea was bringing jobs to East Austin. They hired a young woman who wasn't even a Texan, much less an Austinite, to run the program. She didn't have any experience running this kind of program. Did she read the African American Quality of Life? Did she read the Hispanic Quality of Life, et cetera? Did she look to see what projects the city had on the east side that could potentiate jobs? No. So when six months after the fact, then at the event, she had, uh, she had us all do, we were all in these little sections that we had chosen topic-wise. And then uh, when the section started, people had questions or wanted to have discussion. They said, oh, no, we have the questions. So then they, we had to write these little stickies, and they put them on the board. She had, I don't know, 30 million stickies at the end of the deal. They paid her to coordinate the stickies. The stickies are nothing. So then when we had a meeting six months later to discuss that, she said, uh, how many people went to the conference and most of the people, it was a large group, raised their hand. And then uh, how many people thought the conference was effective? Nobody's hand went up. And she said, well, if you have any comments one way or the other, well, you know, I could hardly not be the first one to have my hand up. And I said, I thought it was a failure because you, did you, and I asked her, just in case I was mistaken, did you read any of these things? Did you lo look for the projects? No. And I said, my case is rested. And then a Hispanic guy happened to have his hand up, and he said, well, you know, what do you, what do you answer to what do you need? And he said, we'd like a half a million dollars in our own bank to run our own credit. So none of that has happened. <laughs> none of that's been funded. So I have a really hard time anyway. So, you know, so it, con it continues, and we just continue, and then we do something else, and we'll either find a better way, and you ask me a question about how we're going to bring people around. I think we end up bringing just one person at a time, maybe two. You get somebody who is willing and curious enough to go to an undoing racism class from the group in um, New Orleans, the... Uh, People for Survival Institute. I, I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly, but they've been teaching these courses for 30 years all over the United States. You know, people have to be educated, and that's one way they get education, and I believe education serves everybody. I think everybody needs to go through that class. All ethnicities, all colors, everybody. 
good. Don't you like it when you ask me questions and I just go on and on? Yeah. Like you said, um, education definitely is a start. But um, what else do you think might help as far as um, dealing with the uncomfortability about it from, um, you know, the standpoint of, like you said, uh, not necessarily wanting to... not necessarily wanting to um, continue it, but having it... It's so institutionalized. Yeah. It's so... uh, Racism as a construct, as a reality, as an oppression, is so institutionalized. I mean, we don't even know. One of the classes I took over at HT, or there was a seminar there, and uh, at one point, uh, let's say 16 of us each went up with a piece of paper and on that piece of paper from way back was a law that had been instituted about black people. And we were totally blown away. I mean, on one hand, it kind of maybe paralleled the undoing racism, except this was a totally different audience. I just think there, I think at some level, So if people want to get off the hook and say, I'm not prejudiced, that was somebody else, that was back then, I didn't do that. Well, at some level, we know we're always doing something because that's just the way that is at this point. But if you want to get them, let them off the hook or say, okay, you're off the hook. But there's a caveat to that. You're off the hook and what will you be doing to verify what the policies are in your school in your church, in your place of work, you know, all those fields. What will you do to, to check and learn? And then if you find something there that is discriminatory, what help, because I think we have to not expect people to go out on their own and do stuff. What help or support would you need to make a difference in, with that or helping to address that? Somehow, in other words, empowering people to be the good that I think ultimately Ultimately, we all are. I believe even really bad people are basically, for whatever reason, doing the best they can with the information that they have. So you got to help them find better <laughs> information, and they have to be supported in doing that information. You know, I would love to see, for instance, schools on the east side be partnered with schools on the west side, students from the west side go to school on the east side for a day or whatever, and vice versa, so that they're, and that they're partnered, so you're my buddy, you know, from your school, and I'm your buddy, from, so that we develop some type of communication. How are you doing in school, you know? I, you know, what happened? Were you bullied today? Man, I was bullied. You know what I'm saying? So because I feel, I don't, I think it was, um, anyway, I feel that we share much more in common than we do in differences, particularly along those levels of emotional needs in order to um, grow up healthy mm. or grow up damaged. <laughs> um, so could you just expand a little bit on um, the difference between West Austin and East Austin for those who aren't from Austin okay. and don't know the background? Okay. So Austin had a West Avenue and an East Avenue, and they were beautiful boulevards, uh, with lanes uh, on one side going north, lanes on the other side going south. And in between were uh, these big islands of trees, just beautiful, it was really lovely. And uh, in the 50s, probably real estate development people, I don't know who, I don't know who exactly, decided that they needed a highway because at that time you'd go up Lamar or out Burnett Road if you were going to Dallas or something up in that area, Waco, blah, blah, blah. And you'd go down a little road if you were going down to San Antonio. So they said, well, let's put in a bigger road. So when they did that, they bought up land that belonged to 
with some level of intimidation, uh, that belonged to the St. John's Missionary Baptist Association. And that land became part of, and that in, in turn created the St. John's neighborhood and also uh, Blessing Tabernacle. Now prior to that, that land where Highland Mall is today and now actually ACC Highland, that land was part of a 300 acre tract that Dr. L.L. L. Campbell, who was the uh, lead re uh, pastor at Ebenezer Church, very important uh, Baptist church here, had purchased and had built an institute for education. And the way the wording goes is he, uh, he provided uh, for 500 orphans, and I'm not quite clear on what the context of orphans is, but he provided first through 12th grade education in the 20s, in the teens and the 20s, to African American children being taught by graduates of historically black universities. That's a killer legacy. They were getting education, I believe, that was better than whites were getting. Now, they weren't exactly in Austin because that wasn't part of Austin at the time, but it doesn't matter. Then they would have huge campground and they would bring in people. People came in for everywhere, a lot of where, uh, to get adult education and different things that would help them support having a prosperous life. <coughs> so that went on for about 20 years or more. And then he got sick and he died. And somebody else came up as moderator of the St. John's Missionary Baptist Association. And then the land laid fallow for a while because there was a depression that came and there were a whole bunch of Ku Klux Klan in town and everything just got uglier and uglier and uglier. And the association just said they couldn't afford this anymore. I don't know what all the, you know, there's probably about 92 stories floating on that. But ultimately it was abandoned. Ultimately the land was sold and ultimately I think either a graveyard was dug up and or properly moved or not. But anyway, that was all part of that. And what was your question? <laughs> I, man, I just fell off into my rabbit hole. I mean, honestly, it's, it's great. The, um, I just asked you to expand upon the difference between the which you did greatly. Right. Honestly. Well, yeah. Oh. So that, anyway, that IH35 okay. and the, 19, well, the 1928 ordinance said that people of color had to move on the other side of East Avenue. East Avenue then becoming about 30 years later, a little less than 30 years later, I age 35, which was a different kind of, you know, when it was still East Avenue, it was East Avenue whatever. I don't, but it was still, if you want services, you go over there and then we don't give you any services anyway, because there's so much interesting history that I've just learned in the last year about uh, Austin and where uh, blacks lived in Austin uh, in general. It's just so interesting, you know, how uh, blacks lived along creeks, one, because of access to the creek, but also because that was where they could live, where because uh, the land was cheap or the housing was cheap, and that was the most likely housing to be taken out in floods, of which there were a lot more back then. So, I mean, you know, I'm just saying, on level and level and level and level, you know. <laughs> And it was already so extremely well established, I'm not sure. And then there's so much, like this history of Dr. L.L. L. Campbell. When I started working on it, the association has some of the history, but I'm so curious when a man, I don't know what else he did, but when a man has given so much to a community in education, he even helped fund uh, a college down in Seguin and another one up in Waco because of his relationship to white power. So something, there's something, little something story that I have not been able to find. I know that he was considered at some point, according to one thing, article, one thing I read, he was considered an accommodationist, which I would have to read as what? Uncle Tom. Because, but not really, because that can't be quite right. Because he had power, because he had relationships to power, 
and power did things for him that they weren't doing for other, other people, like giving him money for these colleges and like forgiving the mortgage on the land where the institute was. So let's say he did something, which probably did because I think he was a human being, and it, and it became dis, you know, disrespecting or whatever of his community as they perceived it, whatever. He even started a newspaper, and I guarantee you that newspaper wasn't all kowtow. But some reason, I, can, I can't figure it out, with some reason he is disregarded. Some reason, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but some reason I feel I don't understand why when somebody has given gifts of just say those 500 children, nobody else, first through 12th grade education, why are you not lifted up? What happened to those children who became adults likely in this community? They were children with education. That meant that their children were going to have education and their children's children. Well, then you get into Anderson High School, which was the center of that community before desegregation. Okay, and everything functioned around. And at that time, it is said that more children graduated from that high school, Anderson, which was all black school, college bound than from the white school. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to understand because I think legacy is so important. And I'm, I hope, and I can't wait to be wrong, but I'm trying to understand why this person is disregarded. Why we don't have an, uh, a conference, which is what I wanted ACC to do. I wanted them to have an annual educators conference and I wanted them to name it either L.L. L. Campbell or Dr. L.L. L. Campbell and because there's this extraordinary, to me, historic relationship on that land, and there's a lot to be said for place, blah, 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 and then build that out. I mean, I can tell you more stories about uh, the guy. There's three streets by me. There's Eilers, Martin, and another one, and another one that'll come to me. Eilers ended up starting Austin National Bank. Well, and that bank was here forever until all the banks, you know, started breaking up and being bought by the bank. Ever. Very powerful bank. Okay, well, he and these other two guys bought land really close to the, um, the Institute's land, and they platted it for, guess what, affordable housing because there are all these people up there building as the Institute continued to exist. Now, they never, for whatever reason, it might have been close to the time of his death, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> <coughs> but they never actually built this. But when a developer came up there in the last few years and he got this plot, of this lot, he found in the drawer a book with documentation of that area of land going all the way back when it was part of Coahuila, Mexico. So he had this information about that lot being platted for three houses. So he built three houses on it. And those were, so were affordable houses. So what I'm saying is the whole history is coming around. And Eilers also served on the board for Houston Tillotson, or Houston Art Tillotson, because they didn't come together until the 50s. <coughs> <coughs> and both universities uh, are supported by the Methodist and the Presbyterian Church. And that still happens to this day. So there was something going on at some time early on that said blacks deserve a good education and this is a good education. So what happened? Where did the conversation change? Who came up in power that said, no, we don't think so? You know, they're talking about renaming schools and everything now. I said, if you're going to start renaming things in Austin, you have to rename everything. Because at that time when everything was named, there was nothing but prejudice straight across the city. And leadership. Now, I'm not sure. I'm sure there were exceptions to the rule, but the rule seemed to be that. So my frame is it would be better to sit down and have a conversation about who the time, the context of when these schools were built, what they were named, how they were named or why they were named that, and then uh, 
what has been the effect on policy and all the systemic stuff, and then, and only then, consider a name change. Because if you don't teach, and, and then going forward, how are we going to change policy? What's going to change culturally? Because if we don't change it, guess what? It's another one of those little bows. I mean, I got somebody else's name. What's your name? Dion. Yeah. Dion. We're going to call this school Dion. But we're not changing anything else. We're not changing the policy. We're not changing the college culture. And there are going to be a lot of people still walking around who don't know anything and who are just going to continue to say something. And it's going to be an uneducated opinion. Uneducated, yes, opinion. It's not going to be an educated understanding. So I'm not for, I, it's not that I'm, I just don't think, I just don't think that's the starting place, whether that ends up being an indie play. I don't think we ought to do like they do in New York. PS1, PS2. PS 35, you know? I mean, hello, let's just depoliticize the whole thing, not make it personal. Except we need to keep L.L. Campbell Elementary. What was the name of the school you went to? Uh, elementary school or high school? Mesquite. Oh, Mesquite. All right, well, that doesn't count. How about you, Dion? Uh, same. I went to uh, middle school in Detroit. Detroit. And the name of your school was Spain? Was that named after a person? Uh, yeah, but I don't know. Well, I, so that's another point. I don't think most children in most schools have any idea anything of the history of the name. It's not called Colonel B. Travis School. I mean, you know, there's not that, they aren't even have a context and it's not taught. Why, this is why this school was named this. This is what this person brought to the community. Because if they'd been teaching that, and there's probably a good reason they weren't teaching that, because I can tell you these later school names like Dr. Campbell and um, this other one I'm not remembering the name for right now. I know the people, but I'm not remembering the name. If the names of the school, this is like, okay. And the names of the school were taught and why they were named that and what is the virtues and why as a student here, do I want to emulate any of these virtues? What is the value, character, blah, 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 all that stuff. They, supposedly teaching school, how does this reflect that? Then I think it would have come up a lot sooner and differently, potentially, about these other names. Because first of all, you would understand that most of these schools were built in the late 40s and early to mid 50s, and that, uh, uh, and even if they were updated later, it doesn't matter because they kept the name. But they were built in a time when there was high, high active bigotry, prejudice, whatever, whatever all the terms were for that time historically. I just think we're missing an opportunity, and I hate to see the opportunity missed. I really made a woman at the book swap this morning really unhappy when I was telling her my point of view. And she said, well, what about these little children going to the school and they find out this horrible person that was in charge of slavery? And I said, well, who are you talking about? She said, uh, let's just say, Robert E. Lee. And I said, well, he was not in charge of slavery. <laughs> And then she said, well, you know what I mean. I'm just talking about this for the, and I said, well, that's where we get into the slippery slope. Let's sit down and have a conversation. And she said, those little children are going to be hurt. Little children are not going to be hurt. You have to teach them to be hurt. You know, anyway. You know, there was a, a musical called South Pacific, and it was about the Navy being in the South Pacific, and they were occupying a particular group of islands and one of the officers fell in love with one of the Polynesian girls and uh, and he sings a song about how you have to be very carefully taught how to hate and to fear and I think I don't know how carefully you have to do it because it seemed like we do it just a pretty good job by osmosis but I do believe it is taught I worked for a family in Washington DC took care of their children I was going to school and the father would come home and he would say, he worked at a bank downtown and he would say whatever he'd say. And I said, you can't say that here, Parker, because your girls don't have any other experience except the one you bring home and the woman who comes to clean the house. So you cannot, when you say that, you're limiting your daughter's understanding and capacity to understand what the world is. 
and I don't remember. So then later on after I left, there was a young black woman who came and, and lived and uh, took help with the children. And she, uh, I think her very presence helped him even deepen that understanding. Anyway, it was just, you know, times change and other things happen. So with that being said, um, especially that topic, so powerful, of you mentioning the perspective that people bring to their household defines that perspective for the rest of the household. Um, what, what ideas do you have on that? Um, how do you deal with that? How do we begin to have a conversation about that? How do we kind of reconcile I think we unhook. I think we unhook from all social media. I think we unhook from every bit of it. I think we refuse to participate in things that uh, contribute to the lie. I really do. And then uh, there's a group in Dallas that has something called dinner, where you just every a group of not a big group, but let's say a group of six, six to eight people come to dinner and have dinner uh, across all ethnicities. Blah blah blah. That's where it happens. I participate in something here in Austin that's different but similar in a way. And that is, uh, there's something called Global Austin. So when a group is visiting from someplace in the world uh, through our State Department and they make a tour of the United States and for whatever reason they come to Austin for something that they're studying, then Global Austin will put out a blast saying who will offer home hospitality, which means that people come to your house, you fix a meal, and they visit with you for a couple of hours. That's it. That to me, they say that's the thing that's most important to the visitors. They want to know, will they be able to have home hospitality? Because that's just a whole different perspective. So, you know, so I would never know about those countries because I'm not a traveling kind of girl. So I would never know about those countries except through the people who come to my home. So I think that's it. Invite everybody home. Yeah. Any particular um, instance where uh, family was invited into your home that kind of just sticks out to you? Well, and uh, yeah. I mean, I've learned culturally about different cultures from other parts of the world. Um, you know, through many sections of Africa, many different countries from Africa all the way to far Eastern Europe, fair amount of Western Europe, some Asian. Is that what you mean? Are you thinking about a particular instance? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> now let's see, the most recent would have been, um, I had a delegation from, um, Central African Republic. Huh. I didn't learn, I don't know if I knew before, but I learned afterwards that it is the poorest nation in the world. Imagine what you'd have to do to be the poorest nation in the world. The people were lovely. But what I found out, uh, so, the, so the country is both Christian and Muslim. And this Christian man who was at the table said, that I was asking him about the customs and marriage and so, so forth. So he says he has two wives. And I said, oh, are you Muslim? And he said, no, but I like that practice. So you know what I'm saying? It is what it is wherever it is. Now, since then, I think things have kind of fallen apart over there, unfortunately. Um, the woman who was one of the women that was with the group, she was a very high-ranking official within that country. But it was interesting, she wasn't from that country. She had married a man from that country. She didn't know he was involved in politics. And it was only later after they had been married that she had become in politics and got elected. Isn't that interesting? If you're in college, which a lot of the people, some of the people were, you are not paid while you serve. I just thought that was so, I don't know. So I don't know. You know, when you look at Africa, then you have to look at all the colonialism. 
You know, I saw, it's kind of like, where do you find a clean slate that where people have been allowed to be the people that they are and they haven't had interference from someplace else? I don't know. But I found mostly people are human beings and they are always, <laughs> they are human beings, and they're seeking to um, take care of themselves and their families. And in some instances, they're able to expand that to the, a broader sector of their community, either their immediate community, their town, or state or nation. But it's, I don't know. A lot of places are so messed up, I don't know how people are carrying forward, except that they have, we have all have hope, and I think we have a willingness to do that. I don't think that really answered your question, but yeah. we're rolling it with it. We're rolling with it. Can um, you and your support do to continue to perpetuate that hope? And from your perspective, uh -huh. um, what can um, maybe your relations with other races um, do on their end to have a hope of togetherness? Well, in terms of Global Austin, I think in terms of offering uh, home hospitality, that in and of itself is indicative to the people who come to my home that I see us as one, I see us as participating at the highest and best level that we're able to do or choose to do, and so that's that. I think in Austin it's showing up as an ally uh, and uh, being willing to be an ally. This lady, I went to a meeting the other day, and this uh, we had this meeting. It was for the uh, Truth, Racial Healing, and uh, Transformation Center that's being developed at ACC. And so after the meeting, um, this lady said, may I speak to you? Or I went over to speak to her, and she said, may I tell you something? I said, what? She said, when you finish other people's sentences, that's what we call a microaggression. And I said, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble because I'm really good at that. And, uh, and I said, well, I mean it in an affirmative way. She said, it doesn't matter. So then earlier in the meeting, I remember a lady was saying something, and I had done that, and the lady had turned to me and said, I have this. So, you know, while I, all that to say is I'm always in the process of learning myself and being taught myself. So I think in so far as I'm willing and I'm receptive to that, and I don't have the answers, even the really good answers I have may not be the answers uh, because they're too logical or whatever. Uh, you know, I think that's all that pretty much any of us can do is be willing. Willingness opens the door. Willingness opens the door for forgiveness to occur, for hope to continue when we don't understand why there should be any hope. Just willingness to have that happen. I agree. So yeah. well stated. Thank you. Um, start to wrap up yeah. the um, interview. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Any story or any instance or any just kind of final word? Well, I had come in here with a particular story. I kind of laid a little bit of the L.L. Campbell story on you, but uh, the story I wanted to tell was about a, uh, two sisters, well, but the parents of two sisters that I went to high school with. I went to a really tiny high school. It was a little small Catholic high school. And uh, these two, uh, these young women, their last name was Mosby. And their parents had come to Austin uh, to attend HT, Houston Tillerson University. And they weren't initially married, and they met there and they married. And they wanted to go attend a Catholic church because that was their faith. And there was not, an, they were, so they looked around for the closest Catholic church, and it was Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is on such and such a street, Lydia. And uh, they went and they found out that it was a Hispanic church and so everything was in Spanish. And so they kind of said, well, let's see what else we can find. So let's see, I don't think there was a night 35 yet. So they went to St. Mary's, which was the next closest church. I don't know whether it was a cathedral yet, but when they went in at the back of the church, there was a sign that said, if you're a person of color, you don't need to come any further. It wasn't that they couldn't attend, but that's where they needed to sit. And they said, no. 
So they went back and for some period of time they attended the Hispanic church because they wanted to keep their obligation in their faith. And then they worked with, I guess, others to gather enough money to buy a little house where they put a priest and the priest would say services in the living room and then he lived in the house. Ultimately, they built a little church. It got to be a bigger church. Ultimately, they built a school because schools were not really great. And ultimately, they built a hospital, Holy Cross Hospital. Now, when desegregation happened, the school was later expanded, became Blackshear Elementary School. So I know in my growing up, uh, I had, <laughs> had the privilege, I guess you could say, of going to Holy Cross Hospital at least once, if not more than once. But the purpose of the hospital was to serve those of the black community who would not be getting hospital care or getting care <laughs> at possibly the white hospital because we know that's the way that comes down. So this younger daughter, Bernadette, was telling this at an Undoing Racism Circle I had grown up Catholic. I had knew I knew that there was a Hispanic church in my neighborhood, and then an Anglo church, but I never thought about it. So all I know that is to say, I just thought that's the way it is. I didn't even know about the existence of a black Catholic church because I didn't know any reason why blacks would want to be Catholic. <laughs> <coughs> but nonetheless, I certainly didn't know that about St. Mary's. Cathedral. So there's a lot of overcoming and understanding to do about things being that's just the way it is without having a concept of questioning it. It's been so well perpetrated. And when I find when it's perpetrated by a place of holiness, a place of faith, that to me is just more incomprehensible. Now, my sister lives up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You go up there, there's an ethnic church for every ethnic. There's a Polish church. There's a mostly Eastern European, but I mean, <laughs> <coughs> and it may have been initially because when they came to this country, they did not speak English and they needed a place of community. And so they went, they did this. But then when do you stop doing that? I don't think anything's necessarily, I don't think you can say it's right or wrong, but is it? And how much is this a policy and a practice of the faith? I don't think you can get away with that stuff. I think some like the big guy in the sky is going to call you to task when the time comes and say, really? That's what you were doing in my name? Huh. living now and uh -huh. generations to come to help them reconcile this reconcile. concept of um, just perpetuating the lie, like you mentioned earlier. How do you, what, what, what message would you leave for them? Well, I guess I'd have to say, like earlier, I'd have to say willing, be willing. I don't know, I'd be interested, maybe after the interview, uh, in understanding what you understand about what and how you feel about the truth and reconciliation process that happened in South Africa after years of apartheid. And I don't know where it's going today because it's all kind of blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, the whole world is like that right now. Uh, but I, the, that, what was that thinking that he had? I mean, he knew he, he Desmond Tutu, I believe, not Desmond Tutu, Desmond Tutu. Yes, huh? The head of the country who was in prison for so long. My brain at this time of day is lucky that I can remember that you're Dion and you're Olivia. Anyway, sorry, but uh, that Desmond Tutu had the under had the understanding that there was only one way to get through that divide. I think that's really powerful, and I don't think we. Uh, I don't think you know. It's kind of like how Gandhi's nonviolence 
how that permeated civil rights. What was that understanding? So I think there's something about truth and reconciliation. I think the opportunity for people to come forth and understand how they've been part of the microaggressions as well as the really horrific major aggressions or historically even, that if it's a safe place of uh, forgiveness and, recon and then I think reconciliation would happen. Because bottom line is, <laughs> that was a what is, I mean, what I like to see, uh, what do they call it? Um, money paid, what do you call it? Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, see reparations paid? Yeah, but I mean, I'd be just as happy to see the schools improved and, and new materials bought. You know, I don't think anybody particularly needs to feel that, it, that it's even, in my opinion, even possible to pay an individual or a family uh, but I do think it's possible to, within the systemic problems, to address the systemic problems and to make changes in that. So I think that that's what, if there were, if all future generations across the board, uh, there's a sufficient number of people, because it never has to be everybody, but that we're looking for the tipping point group, uh, is willing and comes forward and acts on that and is willing to take whatever it is in terms of risk, blah, 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 blah. I don't even know what it'll look like. Hopefully less problematic than today. Then I think there's, there's, there's hope. If there's a willingness, there's hope. So all right. I'm willing. I hope others are willing. <laughs>